the twins that share a brain, but not a personality. We are conjoined by tissue, bone, and blood only. The puzzle behind two personalities sharing a common body. The mystery of the alien growth. It was amazing just how human-like it looked. A below average IQ with the genius of Mozart. <laughs> Meet the most amazing living brain today, the original Rain Man. <laughs> the world's worst stutterer. Has he found a cure at last? A baby born with a condition so bizarre, no one thought he could live. His eyes were turned inside out. His uh, ears were plastered against his head. The amazing boy who defied the odds. The most incredible species on the planet is human. Siamese twins were once regarded as freaks of nature. Medical science now prefers to call them conjoined twins. And at 43 years of age, Reba and Laurie Chappelle are the oldest living female conjoined twins in the world. They're craniopagus twins, joined at the head. They also share a third of their brain. Incredibly, their personalities are almost opposites. I am more like the introvert. It means I'm quiet to myself, reserved. I'm not a quiet person. I'm very out there. I think one of the most remarkable things about anybody who's ever worked with conjoined twins is to realize how unique the two individuals are. Are you all right? Yes. But right. bodily, Lori and Reba's blood vessels and brain tissue are so entwined after 43 years together, they can't be separated surgically. I frankly think that either one or both would die as a result of the surgery because their conjoining is so complex and their shared brain tissue is so complex. So I think there would be brain damage for each of them if they were physically separated. In the womb, they shared the same egg. Yeah, yeah, it's just, like I said, we're so busy with work. But unlike most identical twins, separation into individuals soon after conception began too late. As a result, separation was incomplete, and their skulls remained joined. Reba was also born with spina bifida. She's four inches shorter than Laurie. Her twin carries her everywhere. But as their shared brain developed over the years, the twins' personalities went in separate directions. And over time, they developed very individualized personalities in terms of their friendships, in terms of their tastes. They also do things quite cooperatively. And in that sense, what I've seen from people who are conjoined is a lot like marriages, in the sense of they learn to live in a cooperative physical setting. Lori is the homemaker. She adores the daily shopping. Me, I'd spend my last penny if I could spend it. I don't like to have any kind of money in my pocket. If I can't, if I can spend it, I'll spend it. Reba loathes it. Whatever. I actually hate shopping. I write a list. I love to get what I want and get out, but that's very seldom the case. They have different interests, different personalities. They like different colors and foods. Uh, they are unique individuals, and yet they share 30% of their brain. But how do conjoined twins share life's more intimate moments, like love affairs? I've had four boyfriends. One was a really serious relationship that could have gone into a marriage. I've, uh, you know, done kissing and uh, cuddling and all the other the making out, and I've been on dates where she's, you know, she's really, she's there only in that one integral part, but she is not there in any other way. The original Siamese twins certainly thought of themselves as individuals, 
Later in life, Chang and Ang Bunker married different women, two sisters, and they fathered 22 children between them. Chang and Ang would spend three days at one house and then three days at the other house in order to be with each family, but also to maintain separate families. Mama taught me a lot about living, always be honest and kind. Reba Chappelle leaves the romance to Laurie. Give and give a little Country and Western music is the love of her life. Mama never was she writes songs and performs them in shows around the country. And Laurie has no choice but to go along. There's no escape from give and take when you're a conjoined twin. You'll do just fine. We think that when we look at them, they can't possibly be individuals. As it turns out, they can be individuals and they become individuals universally if they have a working brain. They develop individual personalities, individual names, tastes, friends, and so they develop individual lives within the context of being conjoined. Laurie and Reba Chappelle are living proof that sharing a body doesn't mean you can't have a unique personality like anyone else. I don't consider my life any different than anybody walking on the street who does not have anybody attached to them. You all right? You sure? We are all individuals living on this great, freedomly earth that we have here in America. My individuality is just being me. Marvel or monstrosity? But it is indeed a fetus, it's not completely developed. A birth so bizarre. It's just some sort of freak occurrence. It defies belief. It was amazing just how human-like it looked. The Kleinmans were like any couple expecting their first child. Five months in, Christy was enjoying a normal pregnancy. But then, a routine sonogram showed something terribly wrong with her baby. It was very difficult for me because I felt I was the one protecting and taking care of the baby. Doctors told her that a strange object was growing inside her fetus. Christy was stunned. It was, you know, inside my body. You quit smoking, you quit drinking, you, um, you make all these vows in life to better yourself, to be the right model for your child and to do everything and then the things you can't control. What could the unidentified mass be? A tumor? A cyst growing out of control? Four months later, eight pound, 13 ounce baby, Waylon was born. It was, it was just a beautiful miracle to live. You wait nine months and um, you can't think of a single holiday or event in your life more special. But the new parents were shocked at what Waylon had brought with him into the world. When he was born, they basically a specialist just kind of felt in his abdomen to feel, you know, if anything was, was odd or different, and they felt the mass. Trapped inside Waylon's tummy was another fetus, a parasitic fetus. A twin growing inside a host twin is an incredibly rare occurrence, recorded a mere 76 times in two centuries. It's called fetus in fetu. Fetus in fetu is a rare congenital anomaly where a twin uh, becomes entrapped or encapsulated within the abdomen of the host twin. Waylon was just two days old when doctors surgically removed his twin. What they discovered astonished them. The stillborn fetus had lived for 18 weeks. After it stopped growing, it remained suspended in its own amniotic sac while Waylon's body continued to grow to full term. When we saw the photos of Waylon's fetus, it was amazing just how human-like it looked compared to others. It had um, two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet, deformed fingers, deformed toes, a deformed cranium, a heart, a penis, a scrotum, spinal cord, its own amniotic sac within Waylon. But it is indeed a fetus, it's not completely developed. You know, it dies early on in the process, but it, you know, it grows to, a, you know, an orange size. Um, and so you have a baby about that size. Hey, look over here. Now a happy toddler, Waylon survived his ordeal. The strange case of a fetus that grew inside a fetus. It was a medical 
mystery. And um, once that isolated event was removed, he's been a very healthy, healthy, stable, active boy. Some parasitic fetuses do survive beyond the womb. They're born attached to their co-twin, but with an incomplete body. They have no brain and no heart. They feed off their co-twin's blood supply. Indian-born Lalu was perhaps the most famous of all. He paraded his parasitic twin around the carnival circuit during the late 1800s. And what he had was a couple of legs essentially sticking out of the side of him. Nowadays, surgeons will remove those extra parts. It's not always easy, but they'll do removal of those extra parts. Lalu and his twin shared a bloodstream. Lalu could even sense when his twin was being touched. We don't actually know what happened to him because he's sort of lost to the record. But what we do know is that people were very fascinated seeing this kind of conjoinment. I've been just a stepdaughter and just since I was four. It's had a positive and a negative impact on my life. If he's not the world's worst stutterer, then 27-year-old Eric May comes close. Every new syllable could set off a stuttering spasm. Negative part. In my experience, he's one of the most severe stutterers I have ever seen. And I've been in stuttering for 20 years. Stuttering is a daily torment for three million Americans. Ordering food is terrifying. Talking on the phone becomes a nightmare. And Eric's endured it most of his life. During school, it was hard for me to participate in any reading exercises. Most of us use the left sides of our brains to process speech. But brain studies show stutterers like Eric often use the right side. And something is wrong with the wiring that coordinates their speech muscles. They used to think it was a psychological problem because it really looks like somebody's nervous and that's where it comes from. But in the last 20 years, they've done a lot of research and uh, it's turning out to be a physiological problem. I'm able to help. There are uh, more male stutterers uh, than female stutterers. It runs in families. So uh, most researchers now consider it something you bring into the world with you, rather than something that somebody else produced, like a parent, or uh, some kind of a psychological reaction. So let me ask you a few questions, OK? Uh, you said you wanted to be a professional basketball player. What teams have you played for, Eric? Well, my first year, um, I played in Eric is now stuck on the letter M. Played in he desperately tries to break the cycle. I have played in my first year. I played in this is now Eric's fourth attempt. I can't get it out right now. I'm trying to say. Imagine that at a job interview. He's told me whenever he does go for a job interview, uh, they'll tell him he's very qualified because he's an excellent student and he's a very intelligent young man, but because uh, he cannot communicate, they can't hire him. Okay, Eric, we're gonna put this uh, speech easy in your ear now, if you just... Uh, Eric's way there. with words is about to change. Thanks to a little device that plays Eric's voice back into an earpiece. Okay, now I'm gonna just ask you to do some things for me. Do this. Uh, one. Uh, one. Uh, two. Uh, two. Uh, three. Uh, Eric hears his voice with a tiny delay. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, one, two, three, It's four, also five, played back uh, at a slightly six, different pitch. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The altered sound tricks his brain into thinking he's speaking along with other people. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, it's called the choral effect. 
some of our clients have said, it's like a little voice carrying your speech along and a little friend in there helping you. Using that, that same uh before each phrase, I want you to read some of this for me, okay? Uh, future plans for the shuttle include building a space station. Each what time Eric makes a sound, special. his brain is that sidetracked into processing his extra voice. Uh, Columbia, the first we use the stuttering time. cycle is interrupted before it gets started. Lab tests show a remarkable decrease in the number of words that trip Eric up. I only got a chance to play with him on the court. Who won? He did. Okay. <laughs> Very good. And all he wears is a miniature electronic package. You can see uh, it's very tiny, first of all. Uh, this red part goes inside your ear. The only thing you can uh, see in the canal of your ear is this uh, little flush part. With an 80% success rate, the device is a godsend to severe stutterers like okay, Eric. Uh, tell me um, what you did over the summer. Over the summer, I was preparing for basketball training. It's like an off-season for me. The difference is incredible. Oh, he was just overjoyed. He really was. It was the first time in his life that he was able to say anything he wanted to. Tucked away unseen, this little audio device is transforming Eric's life. From this... By the unit... By the unit... To this... Columbia, the first reusable spacecraft, was launched in April 1981 by the United States. Uh, this space shuttle acts like... We're just uh, applying the uh, head wrench here. This man is about to have brain surgery, and he will be awake the whole time. You're looking at the next big technological breakthrough, a tiny device that actually jams electric signals within the brain. In a normal brain, you would not hear that sound. The deep brain stimulator is the latest cure for the terrible tremors of Parkinson's disease. A million Americans suffer this debilitating condition. The shaking begins in middle age, but can strike anyone in the prime of life. Sam Cady suffered tremors for decades. And uh, this was a very, very, and very annoying. Not only embarrassing, but it was very annoying. You want to start to do something, and, and all you're doing is shaking, and it was irritating. Sam, why don't you try and take a drink from a, pretend you're drinking from your coffee cup here. Yeah. Until now, everyday tasks have been impossible. So when he's trying to write, trying to use a computer, Could trying to drink possibly. and even feed himself, yeah. it becomes quite disabling. Yeah. So he has a deep brain stimulator. We can turn it on with this little device here. Now, tremors disappear the instant Sam's deep brain stimulator is activated. Just that quick. Try it again. Now we we'll turn it off. Yeah. Pretty amazing, huh? Arnold Nash is another Parkinson's patient. He's next in line for this remarkable surgery. All right, we're just uh, applying the uh, stereotactic head ring here. Neurosurgeon Dr. Kenneth Ott is preparing to insert the electronic device deep into Arnold's brain. Tightening these so the frame doesn't move. Our accuracy is dependent on this frame. And this is precision surgery. We call this the bird cage. The bird cage holds the head rock steady during brain scans. These are missed by a few millimeters, and other parts of Arnold's brain might be damaged. When we do a CT scan, each cut goes through the head. It can see the fiducia markers here, it can see the head, and therefore the computer can make measurements and relate any spot inside the brain to this frame. Dr. Ott's target is Arnold's hypothalamic subnucleus. Parkinson's tremors occur when the brain stops making enough of the chemical dopamine. Dopamine keeps the hypothalamic nucleus calm. Without enough dopamine, it sends out electrical signals that cause uncontrolled jerking of limbs. Dr. Ott's first challenge is to pinpoint the hypothalamic subnucleus. Are you awake? I'm gonna give you a little discomfort now. I'm gonna give you a little local anesthetic here, all right? Incredibly, Arnold stays awake throughout the entire procedure. 
The brain itself has no pain receptors. It feels nothing. Two. Are you pretty comfortable, Arnold? And Arnold's responses during surgery will help Dr. Ott avoid damaging vital brain functions. I just made an incision in the head or preparing to put a burr hole, make a 14 millimeter diameter hole in his head. A half inch diameter hole in the skull becomes a window into Arnold's brain. It is an open operation on the brain. It has inherent dangers. The worst complication is actually injuring the brain and having a stroke, uh, bleeding within the depths of the brain, and the chance of that happening is about one half of 1%. So one in 200 patients will develop a stroke from having this operation. This is the electrode driver. So this will conduct the microelectrodes to the target. They record from three of them simultaneously. Next, three tiny sensors are pushed through the hole. Arnold still feels nothing. As the sensors go deeper, they sense brain activity. This is the noise of the brain. Okay, you want to go to 10? The probes sink deeper into the brain. Any moment now, there should be a telltale burst of noise signaling the location of Arnold's overactive hypothalamic subnucleus. But will the probe hit the target? And will Arnold Nash survive the procedure without injury to his brain? Arnold Nash has severe Parkinson's tremors. He's about to have an electronic stimulator implanted deep in his brain to stop the shakes. But first, surgeon Dr. Kenneth Ott has to locate Arnold's faulty hypothalamic subnucleus. It's difficult and risky, and Arnold's awake the entire time. The target is located by a giveaway burst of brain noise. One hour into the tricky procedure, success. In a normal brain, you would not hear that sound. You wouldn't see this hyperactive firing. So what you're hearing is the sound of Parkinson's disease and seeing the electrical manifestations of Parkinson's disease. Put this to the side a little bit, because I think we missed it here. The target location is checked against a brain map. Yeah, I think we're there. Yeah. Okay. The location is confirmed. So now we're going to put the stimulating electrode down this path, because that's the best path in the center of the nucleus where we want to be. Now, the electrode that will stop Arnold's tremors is lowered into place. Putting the final electrode in. Do you have much discomfort during the procedure? Or a little, or? Okay, so now the electrode's in place and we're going to, Dr. Hicks is going to stimulate the electrode with an external stimulator to see if we get any adverse effects. And this is where the miracle occurs, deep in the brain. When it's adjusted, the electrode jams overactive brain signals. I want you to tell me if you feel any tingling, numbness, or tugging sensation. All right, here we go. Arnold's renegade brain impulses no longer reach his hands. It stopped. Good. Did you know that your tremor stopped? Good. Any tingling anywhere? Later today, Arnold will have a battery implanted in his upper chest. You happy with that result, Mr. Nash? Here. All right. After a rapid recovery, all it'll take to stop Arnold shaking is the flick of a switch. For one-time sufferer Sam Cady, the incredible surgery was a life changer. But just the comfort of it, uh, at home or anywhere, uh, just a wonderful feeling that I don't have that problem anymore. Parkinson's patients one day, brain jobs for your average Joe the next. What's the limit in neurosurgery? There's a uh, race of obese rats, and a resident at the University of Pittsburgh did a gamma knife lesion in the posterior hypothalamus, and the rats lost weight. Can you imagine if we had a procedure to treat obesity? Half of Americans need that treatment, unfortunately. Mind-altering surgery is just around the corner, and the only limit is your imagination. He has an IQ of 72, 
with the genius of Mozart. He knows the complete works of Shakespeare, but has the motor skills of a two-year-old. His may well be the most remarkable brain in history. We don't know how this mind works. You know, he knows every zip code in the United States. In many ways, he's kind of beyond description. We sort of hold up Mozart as the model genius. And Kim's ability seems to go perhaps beyond Mozart. Kim Peek is the original Rain Man. He was the inspiration for the 1988 movie starring Dustin Hoffman. Kim's true story is even more astonishing than fiction. He is a true savant. Just one in 20 million people are born with savant minds. Those minds are mentally impaired, but produce surges of sheer brilliance. Savants have an inexplicable gift for music or mathematics or the ability to absorb and recall vast amounts of information. Kim Peek can do all three. He's beyond even most of the savants. From birth, Kim was described as severely retarded. He didn't learn to walk until he was four. Even today, he needs help cleaning his teeth. But Kim can list all 27 amendments to the Constitution. 22nd is term limits, 23rd is the DC vote, 24th makes, it, ma ma makes the voting process free. Every U.S. president. William Henry Harrison, Tyler Polk, Taylor Fillmore, Pierce Buchanan, Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Grant. The 50 H. states and capitals. Boston, Massachusetts, Annapolis, Maryland, Columbia, South Carolina, Concord, New Hampshire. How Kim's damaged brain can do this remains a complete mystery. There are no real clues here as to why he can do what he can do. Kim's head is larger than normal, yet inside there are fluid-filled gaps where you would expect to find brain. You would look at this brain and expect deficiencies. So to see these added skills and abilities and talents that Kim has, it's a mystery as to where that comes from. There is no off switch to Kim's genius. His savant mind is a vast memory bank. With astonishing recall, Kim endlessly drags facts and figures from the recesses of his amazing mind. But for all the millions of facts, Kim has limited ability to make logical links between them. For all its brilliance, Kim's brain lacks basic intelligence. Why? It's somewhat like a word processor in a computer. If you put something in, you get it back out. But you know, a word processor, uh, that's not intelligence. I mean, that's not the ability to creatively think about problems and handle them and manage life. Kim can't dress himself. He, he couldn't vacuum a room or set a table or sometimes, you know, in an absent-minded kind of way, he couldn't find the car if they went back out to the parking lot. But exactly how disabled is Kim's mind? With the help of University of Utah musicologist Dr. April Greenan, we've set up a test for the cameras. Dr. Greenan will help Kim play a simple musical phrase. Okay. Okay. If he can recognize it and work out which composer wrote it, it will be a logical leap that will prove Kim's mind is more than a mere memory bank. But will he pass the test? Does Kim Peek's savant mind really possess powers of higher reasoning? It's no surprise that sometimes the human brain goes wrong. And it is astonishing how many malformations begin while a baby's still in the womb. Three weeks after conception, the brain begins to form. It builds a quarter of a million brain cells every minute. It begins to divide into two hemispheres. And sometimes that separation goes wrong. This medical specimen shows what happens when the brain doesn't divide. The telltale sign is the single eye, called cyclopia. 
A normal brain with two hemispheres designed for specialized thinking is a formidable supercomputer. Its highly developed 100,000 million neurons are protected by a thick skull. They're also cushioned by a third of a pint of brain fluid. But in one in 500 births, the body makes too much of that fluid. The pressure builds and the skull expands, way out of proportion. It's called hydrocephalus. This infant skull has swollen to an astonishing 28-inch circumference. And this specimen from the U.S. National Museum of Health shows what happens when large parts of the brain fail to develop at all during the fourth week of pregnancy. These fetuses develop with brain tissue exposed, and they're usually blind, deaf, and unable to feel pain. Sadly, the condition affects as many as 2,000 American babies every year. The human brain is one of Mother Nature's miracles. As strange as malformed brains are, they often give us a special insight into how the human mind really works. And just sometimes, there's a human brain so bizarre, it's literally mind-boggling. Kim Peek may have the most amazing brain on the planet. He's a savant. His brain is badly damaged. But that brain can remember the contents of thousands of books, and he can name the day of the week for any date. But is Kim's mind capable of more than computer-like feats of memory? What if I play this chord? Can you play We've that? set up a test. Kim is about to hear a phrase of music. Can he recognize it? And can he work out which composer wrote it? Yeah, yeah. What piece is that? It's called, it's called by its German name, but most people use the original name. What's, what's the original name? Vlatva. Yes, yes. Kim passes the test with flying colors. Connecting musical information as Kim has done is something no computer could do. We test Kim with another musical phrase. Is, who's the name of the composer of that piece? I'll, but but, he, but and he and like Debussy's French. Yes, you tell me the name. His name was Edvard Lalo. Lalo. Analyzing a musical phrase alone requires advanced thinking. Matching the phrase with a composer demands higher reasoning still. Who was the famous violinist for which he wrote the piece? Pablo Sarasati. Excellent, excellent. It's proof positive that Kim's mind is more than a mere memory bank. He has had no training on the keyboard at all, but Kim can hear a, a, a full orchestral piece and then all of the instruments, 80 different instruments, he has committed to memory. Dr. Greenan believes great composers like Mozart possessed a genius just like Kim's. Kim and Mozart seem to operate on a higher level than the rest of us. And occasionally when I think about Kim, I think, well, uh, he has trouble buttoning his shirt or, 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 or brushing his teeth because his brain is just occupied with higher things. And uh, this kind of statement was frequently made about Mozart. Kim's piano demonstration for our cameras was a fresh revelation, even to his father, Fran. The piano thing that you did yesterday, just unbelievable to me. I didn't know he could even do that. But I guess as long as he's alive, he'll just keep keep learning more and more. <laughs> but I not everyone agrees that Kim's mind operates at genius level. <laughs> when you look at this brain, you don't see something extra. You don't see uh, something that would make anyone envious of having this brain. This is a brain that uh, sort of more than anything else indicates uh, damage. Kim's mind has one more astonishing feature. Unique among savants, his brain only has one hemisphere. There is no connecting tissue between the left and right side. Why this is, and what it means, remains a great unknown. There's been a lot of effort to determine how the savant mind operates, and no one has ever figured it out. So it is a mystery. Part of the problem is this situation is so rare 
you can't gather up 300 of these people and study them to find out, you know, what's the, the, or what's happening with them. And in nature's trade-off between physical abilities and unbelievable brain power, there's a final twist. The more savants like Kim overcome their physical disabilities, the more they lose their amazing mind powers. Mr. Secretary. Kim's been reading phone books and encyclopedias since the age of four. He still reads three books a day. While the experts bounce between theory and speculation, Kim Peek remains a living testament to the untapped potential of the human mind. I think Kim is a world treasure, that he is simply one of a kind. If his brain can do what his brain does, perhaps ours can do more than ours do. In the history of the world to this point, among the savants I know, I don't know of any who would uh, challenge Kim. I see kids that just light up when he walks over and, and puts his arm around them and tells them the day they were born and the day they're going to be 65 so they can retire and, and all these things. And it's just, he, he just, uh, just loves people. And it, it isn't just one-way love. It, it, suddenly it comes right back. One in half a million babies is born with a skin condition that is almost always fatal. But some kids never give up the fight for life. I think if there was a definition of the word miracle, it would have to have Ryan in it. He was born uh, with deep fissures, deep cracks in his skin. Everybody is thinking, this is hopeless. This baby is not going to make it. His eyes were turned inside out. His uh, ears were plastered against his head. He was not expected to live even the day that he was born or maybe even beyond a week. Uh, the chances of survival are probably zero. I said, do whatever you can. Don't, don't just let him die. Do whatever you can. For all intents and purposes, he should not be on this earth. Ryan Gonzalez is 19 years old. That, in itself, makes him incredible. Ryan is absolutely a medical marvel. There's no other uh, description I could say. He survived uh, a very, very uh, torturous condition, and uh, he's grown up to be a wonderful, as I said, an inspirational human being. Ryan has harlequin ichthyosis, a genetic condition with no cure. Ichthyosis is a skin disorder where the body produces too many skin cells and the skin doesn't shed properly. In the case of harlequin fetus, the skin is very, very thick and, and there are deep cracks in the body. If you think about a nice brick wall that's very solid, it's a good barrier against the outside. But his brick wall is so crumbled and disorganized that all the bad things, like infections and cold, can get through and disrupt his skin. In 20 years of pediatrics, Dr. Boyko had never seen a case like Ryan's. It's so severe that the skin is often cracked down to the meat, down to your um, connective tissues and through to the fat of the skin. And the, the cracks are very wide. Most harlequin fetus babies dehydrate within hours of birth. Those who survive longer usually succumb to infection. Initially, there was no hope for Ryan's survival. Uh, he would have died of dehydration because his skin wasn't able to hold on to water properly. His mother, Anna Marie, was presented with a hopeless situation. When Ryan was first born and he looked so bad, I mean, he looked so bad. And I knew, you know, when they first saw him, they didn't, they didn't expect him to live because I was told, you know, go ahead, you can touch him. And, and they, they took a Polaroid picture of him, you know, like, here's a picture of your baby before he dies. The immediate challenge was to keep Ryan's skin moist. Anna Marie, his mother, had to constantly moisturize the skin with different types of medication, with something like Vaseline or Aquaphor ointment. That sometimes uh, was the cause of infections that Ryan got. Still at that point, they didn't know if, um, if the thing was to go ahead and treat Ryan, because it still looked so 
futile, the whole thing. I said, do whatever you can. Don't, don't just let him die. It would take a miracle to save Ryan Gonzalez. As it happened, Ryan was to have one stunning piece of good luck. Ryan Gonzalez was born with Harlequin ichthyosis. It's a genetic skin condition that leaves the baby vulnerable to infection and dehydration. Harlequin fetus is caused by a genetic mutation. It's a what's called a recessive condition, which means that uh, both uh, parents have to have the gene and transmit that gene to the baby. The mortality rate is almost 100%. The condition is so rare that Ryan's doctors were at a loss as to how to save him. They didn't know how to treat Ryan because they didn't know what it was. They knew it was some type of uh, genetic skin thing, but no one there had seen it before. Then, Ryan was lucky enough to find the right doctor at the right I'm time. Ready. You ready? Dr. Charles Friedman was his million to one shot. Ryan, how are you, buddy? Hi, Henry. Hi, Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks, Ginny. That's all I need. Ryan was a pretty tough cookie. Yeah, he was definitely a fighter. Open real wide. Very good. Excellent. Everything looks great. In 1984, Dr. Friedman learned about Harlequin fetus while on sabbatical in London. I saw a variety of skin diseases, uh, including many varieties of ichthyosis. Three months after his return, Ryan was born. They were in the same hospital. It was a coincidence that saved Ryan's life. With every medication available to them, incredibly, Dr. Friedman's treatment was a prescription acne cream. When I first suggested using Accutane and acne medicine, in Ryan's case, the neonatologists were a bit taken aback. Accutane is like a heavy-duty dose of vitamin A. It makes the skin more flexible, allowing it to shed. They decided to give it a try because without it, Ryan would have died. Everybody is thinking, this is hopeless. This baby is not going to make it. For some reason, I was so attached to Ryan and so bonded that whenever I would look at Ryan, I would think that there's this baby in this shell, because this is like a shell of what ever. I don't know. You know, not you, Mom. Don't you give up on me. Everyone else has given up on you, but not you. After five days, Ryan came off the ventilator but there were other problems triggered by his condition. His skin was so tight, his eyelids turned inside out. Plastic surgery helped, but it often happened again when he cried. For four months, it was touch and go. I think the major problem that Ryan had was that he didn't grow properly, and we really didn't understand why he didn't grow. With a normal food intake, Ryan was still starving to death. At nine months, he was sent to the university hospital to find out how many calories he needed to grow. The university made a stunning finding. Ryan was growing skin cells at a superhuman rate to replenish the layers he shed daily because of the acne medication. At this time, he was around 15 months old or so, and he weighed nine pounds, six ounces. They, he just, they said he, he's not gonna make it. A high-calorie, high-protein, condensed formula was fed through a tube into his stomach. It worked. Ryan started to grow. But for Anna Marie, every baby step was painful. It was so hard to go to these doctor's appointments because people always look to see your baby, and whenever they would look at my baby, they would always nudge, you know, make sure the person next to him saw that baby. And, and that was really hurtful for me, for to see all these people staring at my baby and not staring like, oh, how cute, look, but, you know, horrified. So that, every time I would take him to the doctors and come home, I'd cry. I was just, it was just so hard. It was just, you know, I felt really alone. I felt really alone. 19 years later, Ryan still cannot eat enough to fuel his superhuman skin. He takes food supplements while he sleeps. The Spider-Man mask is to keep the feeding tube in place. Oh, look at this. Remember this when you started playing the guitar? Yeah, my first lesson. For the first few years of his life, 
I guess I really didn't know how long Ryan was going to live because I know that every single birthday up until when he was five years old and when I would have a little birthday cake and be doing a little birthday celebration for Ryan, when I would be singing happy birthday to Ryan, I would be choking up and sobbing because it would hit me that he made another year. Oh. Life for Ryan Gonzalez is like an endurance race. He's been hospitalized close to a hundred times. His treatment is trial and error because no one expected him to live this long. Ryan Gonzalez is certainly to me one of the most inspirational people uh, that I've ever known in my life. He has overcome odds of probably a million to one in living. He now is uh, going to high school, has lots of friends, swims and uh, bike rides and triathlons. Let's go! Which is quite amazing when you think about it and something that I certainly don't do and can't do. There is no cure for harlequin ichthyosis. Ryan's skin has no defense against infection, disease, and sunlight. But rather than cocoon himself away from the outside world, Ryan chooses to meet every challenge head on. Swimming is terrific for Ryan. First of all, because the water is nice and cool, it's a natural cooling for his body, which can get easily overheated. Second, the, the water supports him, but it's not so hard to push against that it's going to hurt his skin or slough his skin off. Anna Marie never thought she'd see this day, watching her son compete in a triathlon. For him to go from what he was like when he was born with such a rare, severe, severe skin condition and to be able to be out swimming a mile in, in salt water is just unbelievable. One day I saw him, he was standing at the rail looking out there and watching the swimmers and I told him, I says, Ryan, you know, do you want to do this? And he says, I could never do this, you know. You know, look at me, there's no way I could do this. And I says, yeah, you could, man. And I says, let's do it, you know. My first shot, I didn't do that good. Could it get an A painful first time because my skin was done today? Yeah, we got 8,000 riders going to Tucson yeah. for the race. It'll be fun. Everybody in the group we ride with is really inspired by Ryan. We take the beginning group and they're like, we're couch potatoes, but look at Ryan. It's really neat to have him out there with us. Ryan has made medical history. There are some kids that are still alive with it, but I believe Ryan is the oldest living person with it. I'm sure if you said to somebody, I can look into the future and he's going to be a triathlete, they would have locked you up in a loony bin. <laughs> It would be impossible. So I think Ryan had such a strong, strong will to live. He has a mother that loves him very much, and he had really, really aggressive medical care in the beginning. The hard part is never over. Ryan's hearing and eyesight are impaired. His skin needs constant treatment. And although Ryan's intelligent, he's still a couple of years behind at school. Despite all that, Ryan Gonzalez is still winning. His prognosis is excellent at this point. He should continue to get a little better all the time, and uh, hopefully he'll be able to live a, a normal life. From the day he was born, he still has that same fighting spirit. It, it's really nice for Ryan to be able to do things with me, to do different events with me. What? <laughs> 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 Can you keep grabbing me? Well, 